Welcome to Breaking the Silence of Design. This is the first in a series of podcasts designed to discuss justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion in the design and construction profession. I'm Karen Compton, and I am co-host as well as the uh, owner, principal of A3K Consulting. Hi, and I'm Gabrielle Bullock with Perkins & Well, principal and director of global diversity here in Los Angeles. And I am the co-host with my good friend, Karen. You are also the 2020 Whitney M. Young Jr. Award E. Woo woo. Woo woo. Yes. I'm only sad that we didn't get a chance to celebrate, but we'll have to do that after COVID. Oh, we will definitely. We will have to do it. As soon as I get the award, by the way. Yeah. Oh. Physically. Physically. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, fair enough. Well, today you and I are going to sit and kind of have a conversation about justice and equity, race, racism. Uh, I think you and I have spent more time in the last two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, five weeks on town halls, Zoom meetings, meetings with public officials than any other time in our friendship. Yep. Schools, Schools other organizations. Other organizations. Yep. And I think, I don't know about you, but I know what caused me to reach out to you to say, what do you think about doing this podcast? But I think for me, it was probably the eighth or ninth uh, town hall. And I think I called you afterwards and I said, I, what do we do now? Like, where do we go now? And I think that was the impetus for me. Like, what was your impetus? Because I know, that, I know people were calling you left, right, and center, and you did not have to do this. So aside from the fact that I just coerced you into it. No, um. you said, let's do this. <laughs> I said, yes, and there's no backing out of that. So, you know, I think that, um, I think our purpose really is to have this safe space, like all the conversations we've had with all these organizations and other people, other practitioners, is find a place where we can, and I hate this term, unpack. I know, I know. The issues of race, inequity, exclusion, micro, yeah. microaggression, biases, unconscious or not, yeah. um, and look at it, how it's been so intertwined in the design profession. Yeah. Architecture, interior design, construction, um, and that these issues have impacted every part of our practice yeah. and the profession. And so, I mean, everything from how you build a pipeline, recruitment, retention, our clients, yeah. culturally, how do we, how does this impact our ability to do good culturally relevant work? Um, so I think it's a lot. Um, and for me, and I think I use this term with you, I think we all need to figure out and understand how to look at our work and our firms yeah. and our practice through the Jedi lens. Oh. Justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. But we'll go well, into that um, further. So. Where do you want to go from here? What I would say, I guess I would start with perspective. Um, I was listening last night. Um, I've had several conversations with city leaders in my own city. I don't live in the city of, of uh, Los Angeles proper, but I've had conversations with other city leaders and the police department. And I've really had an opportunity to kind of sit and listen and them kind of sit and listen to me, which has really been incredibly helpful. Um, but I would kind of begin with an understanding that there are all different kinds of racism. Um, there's individual racism, it's what people hold as their personal beliefs. Uh, there's interpersonal racism, which is mm -hmm. what people share between each other. Uh, there's institutional racism, which is really what we're gonna talk about, which is where the institutions and the systems and the processes themselves are discriminatory against people of color. And then there is structural racism, uh, and that structural racism deals with everything, government, systems, housing, community, all of those aspects. And while we may not be able to get down and through and all, um, all of those aspects, my hope, my goal would be able to kind of lend a lens through an understanding of how deep racism goes, mm -hmm. um, to your point. 
and then to really kind of offer that perspective that when we talk about it institutionally, it is largely about money, who has it, who doesn't, uh, who earns more, who earns less, power, who has power uh, to make decisions, to coerce, to uh, bring people along whether they want to or not, uh, and control. And oftentimes the control issue is policy, practice, um, what we have even called institutional norms or have come to mm -hmm. accept as institutional mm -hmm. norms. So that's the perspective or the lens through which I think I've, I look. Um, and it's a big lens. Right. <clears throat> and I think that um, I look at it and I try to look at it um, in how it's impacting the business of design, yeah. the culture of design, yeah. the education of design, what we all do every day. And so I look at it and say, okay, I'm not surprised by the racism that exists. Yeah. I'm not surprised how it shows up yeah. in my profession, in my world. Um, but I don't think that everybody in the AEC industry understands that or have been, um, hasn't been top of mind because yeah. most don't um, see it every day. But I do think that, I mean, they don't see how it's impacted or embedded in our practices, mm -hmm. how firms are run, how people are hired mm -hmm. and promoted. And I think what's different now, and I'm actually going to say I'm actually hopeful and optimistic that that's something for you. That this reset, which I, I call what's happened in the last six months as, as a reset, what's different is that everybody saw George Floyd get murdered. Yeah. By the distraction of being sheltered at home yeah. or not being distracted, that everybody could see it, that I think everybody, a large majority of this country, has witnessed and has seen firsthand what people of color, and particularly black people, yeah. have lived with for years. So some are, you know, could be um, surprised that yeah. people are surprised. Um, I'm actually going to go with optimism for the mm -hmm. moment that this is not just our issue; it's everybody's issue. Um, black people, indigenous people of color, um, and so. I'm not sure if I answered your question, but I think that's the perspective yeah. that I'd like to, that, that I've been, only way I can have all these conversations and be on all these Zoom calls and panels yeah. and talk about race um, is to have that mindset yeah. that I can help propel, which I've been trying to do for the last eight years, propel this profession forward. I, I think if you look at, personally, if you look at race and racism as a beach ball, <laughs> and you look at and you look at every single color on that ball as a perspective. We're all looking at race. We're all looking at racism. We're all looking at it through a different color. And it's not that yours is right or wrong or that mine is right or wrong. We're just looking at a different color. As long as we don't lose focus of the fact that we're still looking at the beach ball, I think mm -hmm. that's the part that's mm -hmm. the most important. I I am hopeful, much like you, that not just people of color are now looking at the red portion of the beach ball, but that there are other people who are not of color that are looking at the ball and saying, what can I now do? Right. And that to me is where the, the hopefulness is. Which I think that's what's happening now. And I can't wait for you to test the beach ball concept <laughs> on your next guest. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm actually going <laughs> yeah. to do that. I'm going to do that. But before we get to that next guest, um, we have a series of questions. So um, right at the beginning of this, um, we, we allowed uh, people to kind of post their questions. And we just figured that we'll pro what will probably make the most sense is for you and I to just have a discussion and, and try and frame some context here for not just the podcast, but for answers that people may have mm -hmm. as they sit and try and be in their own discomfort to formulate policies and practices and go forward. So um, here is the first question that we had received, and I thought that this was a really good place to start. What is the difference between justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion? And why is it so important to understand? Mm -hmm. 
Well, first off, well, I, I'm glad you asked that question of whoever asked it because it is misunderstood. They are used interchangeably yes. and they are not, and some come before others to be impactful. So um, I will say that being the director of global diversity for Perkins and Will for eight years, the diversity and inclusion part of that um, has gone fairly well. I will say that when we talk about equity, we talk about racial equity mm -hmm. and anything around race, um, it's, it's gonna take some more time. So anyway, so let me start with this. So think about going to a party. So diversity, is asking somebody to come to, to inviting somebody to the party to the party. Okay. Inclusion is asking them to dance. Okay. Equity is asking them to share their playlist. Hmm. So now fast forward to last couple of months where I've um, recently heard the term Jedi, mm -hmm. justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. So if you think about if you lead with justice because justice, um, leading with justice and equity in our processes and approach in design will hopefully result in an outcome of more diversity and inclusion. And justice is the concept of fair and just relations, mm -hmm. rela relations between the individual and society as measured by mm. the distribution of wealth, mm. opportunities mm. for social ac activity and social privileges. Just mm. what you said about um, power. Equity, that's the part where you're asking them to share their playlist mm -hmm. you want mm -hmm. to, is about making sure that people get access to the same opportunities, sometimes our differences, mm -hmm or history can create barriers to participation. And we've so that. we must first ensure equity before we can enjoy equality. Mm -hmm. And that's the other thing that many people confuse as synonymous yes. is equity and equality, yes. and they are not the same. That is true. If we think about, and I'm gonna throw in social equity because I think that's how, as architects and designers, our impact on the built environment really does engage the whole social uh -huh. equity. So social equity, economic, legal, environmental, and developmental rights of access to the collective resources of a society with all encompassing effort by means of equal say and insight for all members of society. Mm -hmm. So we really want to engage everybody. Everybody has a say. Everybody is going to experience it um, and should be experienced equitably. In the same way. In the same way. Um, I don't think I need to define equality. I think everybody knows what that means. It's the same for everybody, and that means you're not recognizing differences mm -hmm. and unique perspectives and from whence one came. So diversity, and that's the part where you're asking someone to the party, right? There's different ideas and perspectives um, that result from an individual's culture, background experience, physical, capabilities, skills, ethnicity, education, race, religion, age, gender, lifestyle. So everything that makes us different is diversity. Inclusion, that's where you're asking somebody to dance, an environment that recognizes values and respects and embraces all those characteristics mm -hmm. that we just defined in diversity. Um, that makes us different, fosters open communication, etc. So I think if you, as firms and organizations, if you only focus, focus on diversity and inclusion, you're basically just checking a box. Mm -hmm. I got them, I got two of these and three of these and four of those. And I'm inviting them all to the party. So that's diversity that's and inclusion. That's diversity and inclusion. So if you think about just, if you look at what you're doing and how you're doing it and who you're doing it with from a justice perspective mm -hmm. and an equity perspective, perspective, those are the processes, and diversity and inclusion, those checkboxes, would be the outcome. But you can't, and it's not like, it's not like a mathematical equation, yeah. right? It's not reversible, interchangeable, and you can't do um, D and I before you do J and E. The problem is, is that I do think that as an industry, we spent a lot of time on the diversity and, and 
the, the, the diversity and maybe the inclusion portion of that equation. And we really haven't spent a whole lot of time on the justice and equity component. It's almost like we've accepted those institutional and systematic racist and racism and barriers in parts of our profession that, okay, that's, that's untouchable, yeah. I can't change policy, when in fact, we're in the perfect, we have perfect opportunity yeah. to impact those, those policies and thereby help break down the barriers. I think it's the perfect storm. Yeah. Yes, um, cosmic reset. What I, what I think has been interesting as a, as a sidebar is you and I have been on calls where the people who are sitting around the table who ultimately have the ability to now make a change are having trouble making that change. And it's not because they don't want to do the right thing, it's that they don't understand that they have the ability now to break that mold and to say, this system doesn't work. Mm -hmm. This process doesn't work, and I'm now at the place where I can actually make that impactful change. There, there's at least one or two phone calls where the people that are leading those discussions have the ability to, to make that change, but they, I don't know that they necessarily understand that they can finally do it. Yeah, because I, I think most people don't understand how to make the change. What's my next move? Yeah. And there's no roadmap. But you have to start with, I need to make a change. Yeah. And I watched John Lewis special last night. My favorite quote was, um, <clears throat> find a way to get in the way. Mm. Find a way to get in the way. I think I've been in everybody's way for 14 years in this profession. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I, th I don't know if I can get in any more ways. Uh, I just come as I kind of think about it. But I'm going to keep that one at the forefront of my mind. So uh, here's one of the, one, another question that we got. Uh, we've got, we received a number of questions. I'm gonna try and get through as many of them as possible. I thought this one was really interesting. Uh, much of the conversation around Black Lives Matter seems to be about black versus white, white privilege and the need for recognizing it and calling out racism and being an ally. As a woman of color, but not black, in some ways I feel excluded from the conversation and wonder if I can play a role in making change happen. I am trying to embrace stereotypes, recognize my own privilege, and call myself forward to listen more deeply to everyone, but I would like to do more and don't know what's okay for me to do and what is the best way to serve. I would love to hear what you think. Great question, and I've heard a couple of times at least. Um, I would say continue to ask questions. There is no wrong question, there's no, it may be awkward, but, but as long as you're making the attempt um, to put yourself out there, yeah. to take that risk, um, I, don't, I, think, I think that's the way to go. Yeah. If you're not, if you don't know what to do, I think silence is not an option. No. Silence, and to use your term, makes you complicit. Um, but really make, make the attempt, speak up, if you see, um, speak up and challenge any racist or discriminatory behavior that you see. Yes. And, if, and, and call people on it. You don't have to call them out. Call them out. But you can certainly, you know, in any way you see fit, let them know that that's just not okay anymore. Um, there, as I said before, there is no roadmap yeah. to fixing this 400 plus year um, problem that yeah. we have and it's gonna take everybody, and you know what? Many of us have been uncomfortable for a long time. Well, what I appreciate is that you've said to ask questions. What I have appreciated in this journey is the number of friends that I've had that have reached out and said, I don't quite know what to say, so can I ask? Mm -hmm. And I think my, my um, appreciation is that, number one, they had the, ch the, the courage to ask. Um, but then on the receiving end of it, I had to take a deep breath and go, okay, here comes the floodgate. <laughs> um, and be willing to be open to really truly trying to educate other people. And that has been, I don't know about you, but personally, um, that has been quite a journey in trying to just um, 
receive, process, and then give, try and give as much guidance and direction to someone else as possible. Yeah. Especially when they're really coming from a place of good heart. Good, you know, I'm really trying to understand. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, and I've gotten lots of, you know, personal friends who have apologized. Yeah, I've had- For years yeah. of being tone deaf is what one friend said. And I appreciated that. Yeah. Um, so, you know, everybody's gonna get through this um, their own way. But I would say that um, we can educate and help advise, but the burden is really on everybody else yeah. to understand what this is all about. So here's a kind of a follow-up question to that. Um, I'm a white guy who is trying to learn about unconscious bias and educate myself, but I'm not exactly sure where to start. What are your recommendations? Okay. Brave soul. Dis but, but but we want to encourage. We want <laughs> to encourage can't the do uncomfortable. You. you can't do. Can't we can't do, do without, without you. That's right. Disrupt the systems of whiteness, yeah. fragility, and privilege. And by that I mean, if you're in power, then you have the opportunity to speak up. But if you recognize the vacancies at the table. Mm whose voice is not being heard or represented. Be their voice. Mm. Elevate the voices of the unheard. Credit the, vo the, voice, the voices that you're bringing, yeah. the message um, on behalf of. And, um, and, and so again, if you have the power to create space for the black person or the person of color, then do it. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it was you or somebody else recently um, shared with me that a board, a white man on a board stepped down specifically to give his seat to, um, to a black person. Wow. Wow. No, I Because there were none, none. at the table. And, and I think that, that this process now requires other people to, like you said, to be uncomfortable, yep. to, to recognize that they have benefited for a long period of time and that there is an opportunity to give up something um, that really truly needs to shift. Yep. So by him giving up his seat um, allows for that shift, allows for a different perspective to enter into the conversation that wouldn't normally right. be there. You know, I heard Donna Brazil say once, um, we're not asking you to get up, slide over Just a little bit. Over a little slide bit. over a little bit. Yeah. Make room for somebody else at the table. There's plenty to go around. Yeah. I like that idea. And the of value over. of it is what's really important. We're not saying slide over and let somebody who's not qualified yeah. be there. I want to put that right out there in the beginning. I think that's so incredibly important. Where you where neither one of us are saying let somebody who is less qualified. Right. But to fully recognize the people that are qualified who don't have the opportunity. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out of order with this other um, question, um, and I oh. hope you'll, uh, I know, I know. <laughs> well, actually, maybe I won't. Okay. No, go ahead. I can pivot. Another, <laughs> another word I hate. Another word you hate. Unpack and pivot. <laughs> so according to the Directory of African American Architects, there are a little bit more than 2,300 licensed African American architects in the United States. When, when I first read that statistic, I was stunned. I thought that I misread it, and I thought that's how, that's how many there were in California, um, only to find that that's how much there were in the, it, how many there were in the US. Um, so we have a problem as an industry, not just with um, the number of current licensed architects. We have a pipeline problem. We have a problem in which um, we don't have enough students of color who are also considering or looking at science and STEM and particularly architecture. And, and I wanna give a huge shout out and a lot of credit to NOMA for their summer camp program for, for being able to kind of react on that end of the, the continuum to really do something to try and impact the pipeline. But on the other side of that, we're also challenged about the roles of leadership. Mm -hmm. the, the idea that someone had to give up their seat on a board in order to make way for a person of color um, 
But there's also this issue of pay and pay equity. So in a recent article, the Society of Human Resource Managers said even when African-American men hold leadership positions, executive leadership positions, they're paid 97 cents to the dollar. And for a woman of color, it's even substantially less. So how do we get to a practice, a policy around that um, so that we are looking at not just the pipeline and getting enough people into the profession. But once you get them in but there, once we are get them in, are, how and are we equitable? And how are we being equitable? Well, you know, it's with the Me Too movement and, um, and all of the uh, protest and, you know, talk several years mm -hmm, ago mm -hmm. around Women's March, pay equity was a huge issue. Mm -hmm. And firms started dealing with mm -hmm. it. Some firms started dealing with it. Perkins and Will dealt with it, for, for example. And we did a pay equity analysis, mm. a very transparent. Did you do it internally? We did it internally, and it was verified by a third party. OK, OK. Right, keep every, everybody fair. Um, and what's important is that you do it, you have it verified by a third party, and you're willing and transparent about the results. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily in terms of the person's, the dollar salary. Amount, do, person's salary, but transparent enough to say that in X, in the, just as an example, senior designers in a particular office, right? There is a, dis we found a disparity. Okay. Between the male and the female. Okay. Or the black and the white. Okay. And you correct it. Okay. You do that regularly. Mm. Every time you have promotions, every time you do salary increases, look at it through that lens, through the justice and the, the, the Jedi lens, right? Um, and it's, it's fairly easy to do. And I, and I think that when I say easy, the only hard part is when you find something, you know, if, if you don't want to find out where the disparities are, then yeah, that's going to be hard for you. But if you really, if you really value equity and you want to have an equitable um, and fair practice, then you have to look at everything and see where you might have, you know, not seen what I know, think is a gonna, trend yeah. in, that, in that way. What I think is going to be hard for some people in this is I think a number of people will say, I want to look and I want to know. But the, the, the fail is if you look and you find out and you do nothing, then you're disingenuous. Well, exactly. Well, that's why you have to be transparent. Yeah. You know, we, um, as a firm, we do it f regularly. Um, but clearly it wasn't being consistent. Mm -hmm. And so we reinvigorated how we did it. And actually, um, a staff member uh, made the request. Several staff members made the request. And this is all during the Me Too movement and Women's March and whatnot. Um, we want to see the pay equity analysis done, and we want to see the results. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. But it sounds as though that there is also a culture that supports yes. looking and taking action. That's right. And I think part of this discussion, maybe not today, but certainly part of this journey, is how do we create practices in which the culture is to critically evaluate, look, and correct. Right. Right. And I think that's an incredibly part, huge part yeah. of, of this journey. If you think about what we've been going through for these last couple of months, I look at it as, you know, it's, it's a movement for the moment, but really this momentum, this movement implies action. Mm -hmm. So we must act, right? Movement, move. <laughs> so you know, regarding the pay equity, you know, if you, if you don't want to do anything with what you find, then don't do it in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that's really going to be hard for a number of firms, because I think in the heat of this moment, there are a number of firms that have said, yes, I want to do, but I would want to encourage them. Once you find out, commit, lean in that other phrase that you and I <laughs> say we don't like lean in to making those changes and committing to that path.
Um, I think that's so criti critically mm -hmm. important. Yep. So I believe I'm actually out of time. Are we? Yeah, <laughs> that was quick, right? So I would like to thank you for joining me today. It's the first in a, in a journey. It's not the end of a journey, that's for sure. Um, I would really truly love to thank IBI Group, who is our amazing host uh, for this particular podcast. I'm very happy to, to have had them on this journey. I would like to invite all of you to follow us. Please follow this podcast um, as part of Twitter, as part of LinkedIn, my LinkedIn, Gabrielle's LinkedIn, and uh, subscribe on our YouTube channel. Thank you so very much. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. I appreciate it.